Hey everyone, I'm Michael Hoffman and welcome to Creating Association Videos with Purpose. I'm really excited about tonight. We have going to have an interesting conversation. We're going to talk a lot about what associations are doing with video. And I want to start by introducing Joel Resnick, um, Joel, my partner at Gather Voices. So Joel, introduce yourself and sure. tell everybody a little bit about Gather Voices. Thank you, Michael. So my name is Joel Resnick. I'm the co-founder of Gather Voices and Chief Revenue Officer. And you know, video couldn't be more important than it is today. Um, as you know, right, video just continues to grow. And there's so many different ways that organizations are using it. And for Gather Voices, uh, we found some really unique ways to do that. So video used to be where you could only get people where they were at and you had to send crews to it. But what about the idea of being able to crowdsource content? People are walking around with these tremendous devices um, and it should be easy to get video content from them, but it always isn't. Uh, so that's where we've been able to find ways to do that by asking people to participate in making videos either through their mobile device or desktops or even tablets. Yeah, so the platform itself makes it really easy for the end user to make a video. It coaches them through some of the pain points that they've experienced like poor lighting or poor sound or maybe talking for too long. So you can see here we've got this tutorial that coaches them to do that. That way we're not capturing video of people's feet or of the sky, but of actually them talking about compelling content. Right. And they're doing that directly from their devices. And so think about if you were there recording somebody, you would give them direction on what to say or what to do. Well, we enable you to do that from a digital standpoint, utilizing our talking points. And that guides the end user to know, okay, here's the video I should make and here's what I should emphasize. That way as an organization, when you get it, it's really useful for your organization. And beyond that, we've provided a really easy way to have control over your content. So being able to edit it, being able to manage it and simply publish it directly to your social channels or to your website can all be done in our visual background and back into the system itself. So one of the important things that a lot of clients have told us about is the need to be inclusive and to have closed captioning. And so as you can see, our platform enables that. It can be edited, we can change the font and the color, and that's really drove some really good engagement around the content that they're publishing out there. And that's all done through our backend system uh, really easily. And it shrinks the process of having to take content and manage it from a matter of weeks or days down to a matter of minutes. And an important piece that we also manage is the video digital uh, rights. So the individual, when they submit it, are providing their rights around worldwide, royalty-free, and perpetual rights. That way an organization can use the content when, where, and how they want to. Very different than like grabbing a video off of YouTube or something like that. Absolutely, absolutely. So that content then can be repurposed multiple times. Now, user-generated video and getting it distributed from anybody anywhere is really important. However, our clients uh, also need it for their conferences and events. And I'd love to tell a little story about how we ended up with our video kiosk itself. Sure. Um, so we had a client who was an association that constantly wanted to capture the testimonials or the value of their membership at the event itself. And asking people to do that from their mobile device was a little bit hard to activate. And so we thought about different ways to do this that would account for maybe loud events or loud background noises and poor lighting. And that's where you see our kiosk itself. So it's got a ring light, uh, it's got a wired mic to help kind of block out some of that background noise. And the, the uh, device itself is running on our app. So that ensures that that content that's made right then can be used really quickly. And we have had our clients had the social media team right there watching the dashboard. And as videos come in, they're making adjustments and publishing direct to their That's social interesting. Channels. That's very different than having a camera crew where you're waiting weeks to get that content. And then you kind of wonder whether it's worth editing it and using it. You know, yeah. It's all coming in right away. So excellent. Well, yeah. thank you, Joel. And I yeah. think you know what we're talking about in general is the fact that video is the content that everybody wants and needs today. Video is dominating the marketing mix, right? I mean, there's yeah. so much video content created, so much video content watched, and it just seems to be accelerating. I think there's stats about like 80% of all internet traffic will be video in the next couple of years. Yeah, and did you know that if you include the word video in a subject line for email, it increases open rates by two to three X? Yeah, I mean, that's what's interesting. So it's not just that there's a ton of video, it's that actually video works in terms of getting yeah. people to do the things or engage the way we want. But the challenge is, and I know this firsthand because I ran a digital marketing agency that produced professional video, 
agency-produced professional video is not scalable. That's the challenge, is like you yeah. can't do video the old way and get enough video to, to cover what you need on your website and social channels and all of that, right? It's just, it just doesn't work, and so we need new ways to do it. Yeah, and I think people engaging uh, across social media channels and seeing their friends, their family, and their peers out there making video content translates and seeps back into our businesses. And what they found, uh, industry stats-wise, is that a UGC video can be more memorable and, in fact, has a higher level of trust, which I think we're going to talk about later tonight as well. Yeah, and I think that's a great thing of why we're here at Secudo Studios is the combination of highly produced video that you can do less expensive, more regularly yeah. with user-generated video, member video, um, is a very powerful kind of combination that's totally different than the old way of doing things. Yeah, in fact, there have been studies done in a, a study recently published the late last year that said the difference between highly produced content alone and UGC content, what drives better? It's actually the combination of both that has the best lift. Ah, really yeah. interesting. Great. Yeah. Well, I I'm excited because we're going to welcome Kiki Latalien to join this conversation. Um, and Kiki is so well known in this association market um, because of her, her a podcast, the association chat. So um, I want to bring uh, Kiki on and we can, we can talk. So Kiki, um, you have been doing the association chat podcast for 10 years. And mm -hmm. you have built an incredible community, which is not just the podcast anymore. You have the Facebook uh, community, which is so vibrant. You have a private community that you're building. You have events coming up. Um, so you, you have a lot going on there. So just tell us a little bit about the Association Chat community and, and your, your vision of that. Well, you know, it actually started out as just the most pornographic sounding hashtag you've you've ever heard of, which is ass and chat. And uh, it started out, no joke, it's okay, I'll pause, you guys laugh. Um, it, it started out as a weekly tweet chat, and everyone who knew how to use Twitter in 2007, you know, would show up and they would begin to um, tweet back and forth you know, discussing the topics of the day and we would set forth, you know, what those topics were. Problem was that, um, you know, how do you get more people to understand how to use Twitter and how to actually um, participate in a tweet chat? Many people who use Twitter still haven't participated in a tweet chat today. So along the way as things grew over time you know the the natural question was how do we reach more people how how is it that i can get more people engaged so that like bigger conversations about things like membership models um, can be done in 140 characters plus right we need to go beyond that for something a topic that heady and so uh, video was a natural natural next step for us. And so you're seeing what we're all seeing, right? Which is the that uh, visual media is really important and taking off and, you know, and I think you're seeing that in your world as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the thing about video is that uh, people they connect with you they humanize the person that they see they you become more than a brand so association chat was sort of an anonymous um online place where you got to know each other by twitter handle and then suddenly when people were able to see someone online and see their face they could connect and they <sighs> saw that person as a human and began to form a relationship and so it became a thing where, you know, I would be able to go to, you know, the American Society of Association Executives annual meeting and have people come up like they knew me and hug me and like, oh, Kiki, you know, it's so great to see you. And um, which was awesome. And I think that that's something that can benefit any any organization because ultimately many of us, many people who are in associations are trying to form those bonds, form that community. And so if you can, if you can bring that into your education, your events, um, you can bring that into like a regular series, then I think that you have the ability to form these relationships that, you know, 
people are, it's so valuable. And it's really not just about sort of pushing content out, right? It's also about finding the interesting voices in the community and, and lifting those up and, and sharing those, right? And, and that's connected to something we talked a little bit about, about trust. You know, we're in a world that lacks a lot of trust. And so the brands are not trustworthy on their own anymore. And so that connects to that humanizing thing. But talk a little bit about that, about sort of member voices, community voices, and, and the relationship to trust. Right. Well, you know, I mean, it would be one thing if I had a show and I just showed up and I was always telling you what I thought about things. But the, the magic behind association chat is that it's always somebody else that's coming on. It's always somebody else that's that's joining the conversation that is an actual expert in that area for that topic that I'm talking about. And and because of that, you know, people have more trust, even if they don't, even if for whatever reason they don't want to trust me, they're going to have faith that week after week when I'm showing up at the same time and I'm bringing these voices who are experts and some of them they may know, that begins to build this trust in the show and in association chat as a community. And it's something that I think is transferable. People can do this for, you know, their associations. They can do it for their businesses. And I think more people should. Yeah, what's interesting to me about that is that your role is similar to, I think, the role an association should play, which is as a convener of conversation, right? What, what is an association other than a convening of the members of those associations? They're the ones where kind of the rubber hits the road with the work mm -hmm. in the field. And so being that centerpiece, that convener, is a really powerful way to think about what you're there to do, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, it's really that you're allowing people to come in and be vulnerable. I think that association chat plays an interesting role in that um, it actually allows people to have a space where they can test new ideas, they can share their opinions and not worry about you know, being judged um, from it. And I, and the reason why I think association chat allows for that and other, other types of productions don't necessarily is because you can have a gorgeous, slick, well-produced, scripted thing. And there's a place for that. There is. But there's also a place where you can, you know, provide guidance, provide a structure but give people enough room to be human and give people enough room to be themselves. I, I think that, you know, what you guys do with like user generated content is so important because it's that raw quality that people trust. You don't want everything to be perfect all the time because we all know that that's not how life is. You yeah. Know? Yeah. We've kind of watched that inversion a bit where, you know, when I started, it was all about quality, quality, quality and polish. And, yes. and now if something is too, polished in a certain way and too scripted, the trust goes way downhill. So I want to just talk about one other thing uh, here, Kiki, which is that, um, you know, you're doing this amazing thing and it's, and you built this community and you haven't done it with a ton of resources or, yeah. or dollars, right? And we see all the time videos from <coughs> YouTube or on Facebook or whatever where they're not big institutions, they don't have big teams there, and they're creating really compelling stuff. So why is it, why do you think we're not seeing this more in the, in the world of associations? What's holding people back? Why, why aren't we, um, why isn't everybody running to, to do this? What's, what's keeping them? Do you want to know something? I, you know, I know we talked about this, but, but it's the same thing that there was a discussion I saw online uh, a couple of days ago, and someone said, "Do I have to turn on my webcam whenever there's a Zoom meeting at work? You know, what are you guys doing?" And everybody's coming back, and a lot of people are saying they don't want to, but they feel like they have to, and then other people are saying, "No, no, I just always have my camera off." And there's a lot of concern about how we look. Um, you know, I don't feel like I'm camera ready. You know, there's a lot of concern about looking foolish. And I think a lot of people feel that they're going to freeze or mess up, screw up something and not look professional if they use video. So they're afraid of that 
that it's fear. It's totally fear. And the other thing is cost. People think that it's extremely expensive to do video well. And they also think that if they are not going to spend a lot of money, that they have to have a huge amount of, you know, um, background in technology and that it's just, oh my God, I can't push all the buttons and understand all the wires. And so forget about it. But you're right. If you just look at some of the most popular YouTube series that are out there, I mean, if, if the content is good, okay, if the content is good, if there's, if there's a meaningful message there and people feel like there's a reason that they're watching that thing, then, I mean, you could have a, a ring light like you buy for your teenager, uh, uh, an iPhone, and you can record it and um, put it up there and have a, have a fairly good following, have a fairly good response. But that intention has to be there. Yeah, and I think there's still a little bit of this sense of a one-off or viral, right? Like when you, you, your <laughs> audience for association chat, it comes through time, right? I mean, there, there has yes. to be a regularized, we, we have to be committed to this um, and not expecting every video to be a home run, but it's really the regularizing and the practice and the, and you know, is what, is what ends up building, both building your skills and building your audience. That's been it's your experience too, right? It's so true. I mean, you will get better and, and things, you'll get a better feel for who you're talking to over time. But you know, I think more than anything, if, if you have a very serious desire to create some sort of connection that's deeper than just transactional with an audience, then you need to sort of train them to understand that they can have faith that you're going to be there. And, um, you know, I think of association chat like a church and I've been more faithful. I hate to say this. I've been more faithful going to association chat than I have to church, but, um, I, or any diet or anything, but you know, it's every Tuesday at two, um, association chat's going to happen. There's going to be something there and people know they can show up, you know, they put it on their calendars, they can rely on it. And so to be able to, to be able to provide people with reliability, um, consistency, something, integrity, something where they feel like they can go and they might learn something, they might connect with somebody, they might share something, you know, um, association chat held a very important role um, a couple of times in the past year, past couple of years, when controversies hit in the industry. And when they hit at, you know, pretty much the national level, where do you go to have these discussions? It's like a family discussion, right? <laughs> it's, it's something that you want to talk about. How are you going to deal with it? And there was a place for them to go. And that was association and that's chat. The um, the benefit of building that really high level of trust over a long period of time. And I think every association can do that. They can build that trust and that dialogue with their members. And then it's not transactional. And that really, for me, that relates to this bigger issue of digital transformation that everybody's talking about. Because ultimately what that's about isn't just tools and technology. It's about shifting from that transactional worldview to that relationship mm -hmm. worldview. And I think that's yeah. that's what that's what this is at its core. Well, I think you're totally right. And I think, you know, as much as I brought up church and we've talked about very serious, um, not just church, but this idea of ritual, this idea of consistency, this idea of providing something that is it sounds very serious. But, you know, something else we talked about the other day, Michael, was that, you know, you also can't forget fun. You know, having having space to have fun, having space to get creative. And so what I see with a lot of content now is there's there we have so many ways to have fun and capture glimpses into people's lives, into our members' lives, where, you know, they can share a slice of life, a slice of their life with us, or maybe something fun, their favorite, their favorite hobby, their favorite memory, whatever. And we can capture that and share it, you know, as, as part of who we are as an organization. That's beautiful. The fact that we have technology that can help us to do that fairly easily yeah. and inexpensively 
that's a gift. Yeah. And I think that every association should consider how they're using that. Excellent. Well, Kiki, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out and uh, we could talk all day. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think we hit on some really important points. So thank you. Thank you. Um, that was awesome. You know, one of the things that Kiki said that it really resonated with me is the idea of humanizing uh, your organization itself. And, you know, I, th I tend to think about the groups of people that we have as part of our organizations or associations, pretty diverse. And it may be hard to always represent your total audience, but gaining access through video content and bringing those people forward, those diverse stories, those diverse backgrounds and experiences, that may resonate. That one video that that different person talking about it could hit me and activate me in a way that couldn't have been done yeah. before. Yeah. That's, that's a really big deal and that can't be overlooked because that's something that could be done today that couldn't have been done five, 10 years ago. Yeah, and I think that you're, as a marketing or communications person, you could never make anything up that's as mm -hmm. meaningful or as authentic as what a real member or somebody's real experience is gonna be and you never know what they're gonna be unless you're collecting that and, and encouraging it and you know, having and it part of what you're doing. People are creative. Like, let's not underestimate yeah. the, the creativity of people. Oh, and, yeah. and I was blown away by one of our clients who I would consider kind of buttoned up and very proper, um, had you know their session speakers talking about their events. Well, one group got so creative, they lip synced to a video and they had everybody out dressed up. And that video was widely appealed to and it drove a lot of interest and engagement. And their session was full. So, you know, giving people the capability to say, yeah, you're talking about great stuff, but let's also engage and have fun. It was a really, really big opportunity, yeah. and it worked out for them. That's great. Yeah. Well, we are luckily have another special guest. Yes, so, we do. Um, David Morrill from uh, the Association of Washington School Principals, and uh, David's communications director. And they have done, they are not a big association. They're in Washington State, they have about 3,500 members. Um, in just in the state, and they've just done incredible things. Yeah, he's pretty with innovative. Video. Um, yeah. So I'm really excited to welcome yes. uh, David here. David. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, from from Washington. Yeah, the sun is shining here, just like the stereotype. I feel a lot of pressure. <laughs> I feel like I'm bad in cleanup, and everything that you guys talked about. I mean, I can echo a hundred percent. So yeah. lots of really cool stuff so far. Well, I want to just introduce, so you have this association and you now are doing regular content. You're doing serialized content. You have um, a news show twice a month. You have something called Fast Fives, which I want you to tell us about in a second. You have a talk show. That's a lot of video content for a small association. So I want to just, before, before you uh, talk to me about it, I want to just show everyone just the, like 20 seconds of your news show, just so we can get a sense of the style and the production that you're doing. Sounds good. Hello and welcome to another AWSP News You Can Use. As we sit here and record this episode, many districts across the state are either on late start or closed. Don't worry though, you can see we brave these incredibly treacherous conditions to bring you Washington State's number one principal newscast for Washington State principals. That's right, we are number one. But hey, enough shenanigans, we've got some important stuff going on. I love that. That's great. Uh, you know, never enough shenanigans <laughs> from my, from my no. point of view. But um, so, uh, David, how, I mean, that's terrific. It's so human, as we were just talking about with Kiki. Like, it's not like there's this institution that we're members of. It's like there's people, and we're part of this community of people who are fun and normal and have interesting things to say. How did you make this happen? How did you, in an association of your size, get to the point where you are producing all this video content? You know, we started slow and stuck to it, really. You know, the first thing we did I look back and I cringe at some of our earlier work. Um, you know, we did this Kung Fu, we we're gonna do um, a technology training and like the tagline was, learn how to be a tech ninja. And we did this really cheesy green screen video and a <laughs> dojo and uh, you know, it just started kind of growing from there. Um, we started really with that AWSP news that you saw because we felt like 
our members are so busy. You know, principals, according to a survey we did in the fall, are working, um, I think 70% of them are working more than 56 hours a week. 62% work more than six and a half days a week. So we wanted something that they didn't have to sit down and read the entire time. And that's kind of the, um, the beginning of our newscast. And I just want to talk about we are kind of silly and we do have shenanigans because our members have very serious jobs. You know, they're school principals, it's high stress that we want to inform, entertain and delight. You know, so at the end of every episode, we put in a blooper reel, we pull in stunts from John Oliver. We do all sorts of crazy stuff because we want our, our people to want to watch. Um, so, you know, you talk about humanizing and the celebrity aspect of it. We actually got a um, chance to interview Richard Sherman. I don't know if there are any football fans in the house, but um, we went to Richard Sherman's house to do a little segment for our summer conference luncheon in you know, a newscast. And the whole stick of it was that, um, you know, Scott, our executive director, was going to him. And we just showed up at his house because Scott likes to ask people, who's your favorite principal and why? Because everybody asks who your favorite teacher is. So we show up at Richard Sherman's house. He invites us in. He's like, oh, man, it's Scott from AWSP. Like, I'm a huge fan. You know, when we go in we sit down, uh, we brought an 8 by 10 to him. So he had an 8 by 10 that he pulled out from behind his couch that he wanted Scott to sign. And so you do get that connection of um, your staff being, you know, an expert, a little bit of a celebrity. Uh, and so it, it buys you some instant credibility. And like what you talked about, and I know you'll ask me about the Fast Fives, the same happens on the member side where when you can – you know, put the voice out of your members, you as an association are so much more authentic. Right, so it's not just that you're creating content that goes out, right? You're really trying to lift up the voices of your members. And, you know, Washington is a really big, diverse state. I mean, you're not, the Eastern and Western Washington are really different kinds of places. So how does, how does you know, your strategy around video try to connect people to each other and and you know, you had mentioned to me the word equity, so I, which is a surprise. So how does video really tie into your, your mission in that way? Yeah, we have a fantastic executive staff, mostly former principals. And when we look at what we're doing across the state, we maybe see three to 400 people in person per year out of our 3,500 members. So for the majority of our members, um, our videos and our website, that's our brand, that's our storefront. And we look at it as an equity issue because there are principals in rural, you know, Eastern Washington that don't have the professional learning budget to get out of their building. Their superintendent might not be supportive of them leaving the building. And so how do we serve them? And one of the ways we can do that is through video. So it's not um, necessarily, you know, the best for professional learning, but it really provides um, access and opportunity and equity the way we see it. And for also for our staff, like you mentioned, production videos and the lack of scalability. We still have a relatively small staff in about 15 people here. Um, we wow. can't get to every district. We can't get everywhere. So, you know, within schools, they talk about tier one interventions and those are supports that everybody gets, every kid. So we look at video as our tier one, right? That's what mm. all of our members kind of get for free. Um, we produce it once. It's, you know, as long as the content doesn't change, it's good over time. And um, that saves us, I think, a lot of travel, a lot of staff time. And so if people have questions or if they need updates, go watch the video. And if you need help, um, let us know. And then we can put on a workshop, come to your district, and then we can kind of follow up after that. That's terrific. And so just a final question. I'm thinking about, you know, advice for, I think there's a lot of people at your level, communications director level or a director or even a VP of marketing, um, and they believe in this. They see that mm -hmm. video is driving interest and in content and they want to do things, but they've got to sell that into their organization. They've got to make people believe and and people may have made a video before and three people watched it and so they feel like oh you know i can't go there so if you were giving colleagues advice around you know how should they approach internally how should they talk about it and where do they start what would you what would you say about that i think one of the powerful things is that equity angle and that access angle i mean how do you serve everybody that's one way to do it it really does form those relationships. Like Kiki said, people feel like they know her. I'm a big podcast listener. So, you know, I feel like I have like friends that are hosts, right? Cause I know all this stuff about their profession and their personal life. And it does create that connection. And, you know, you mentioned our fast five series. So we go around the state 
and we interview principals for um, basically one of my favorites is five tips for creating culture. And every school principal, the number one job is to create a culture of success and learning and belonging. And, um, you know, so it's five tips in less than five minutes. They're really high level typically, but our goal is that um, it highlights our members' experience. And if a principal watching can take one thing away, like for example, one of our first videos, um, Jason Smith, principal of Puyallup said, uh, put your money where your mouth is. The budgets are moral documents. So we all say we value culture, but if you put that in the budget, whether that's assemblies, recognitions, whatever that is, um, then you're more likely to pay attention to it. So to me, like that's the kind of tip that everybody knows culture is important. People have an idea how to build culture, but that one thing might have made somebody rethink what they do. So um, to me, like you're asking again for advice, I would say really hammer home the um, – the scalability of it, like this content has a longer shelf life, it's easier than traveling in person, you can use it at workshops. You know, when we use video for, I mentioned our summer conference luncheon, uh, we have a room of about 400 to 500 principals, and that's our kind of our state of the union address for our members. And, you know, it's kind of a boring award, like here's where we are, here's where we stand, here's what we've done this year, here's the people that have been recognized. Um, while well, people eat lunch, but as soon as we put on our newscast, like you can hear a pin drop and people are totally tuned in. So I think creating that authentic um, engagement, highlighting member experiences, and then really selling that, you know, not only are audiences getting younger, I mean, I feel like people my age, I'm in my late 30s, would rather uh, give up, you know, CBS than YouTube, you know, and I think you're going to see that more and more as people, you know, in your associations, your members get younger and younger that not only do you have to be there, but really it is that um, access, equity, and opportunity. And then from the staff selfish perspective, it scales so much better than doing everything in person. Yeah, that's terrific. David, amazing work you're doing, really impressive. So thank you for joining us here in Chicago and um, really appreciate you, you coming on tonight. Yeah, happy to be a part of it. Um, I, this was terrific. I, I think there's some really interesting themes between David and Kiki about authenticity, about trust, about reach, about you know inclusivity with more of your members. Yeah, and you know, um, thinking about communications and thinking about reaching people and having an impact, you know, across leveraging whether it's text or images or video content. Think about how we communicate as humans, right? So being here and seeing you and watching your body language and listening to your tone. I'm getting a lot more in that communication than if I'm just reading something. And you think about how often we just use text in general to communicate the facts. Okay, got it, I can read it, but did it stay, did it stick? Do I believe it, do I understand it? Video content has a way to communicate those things beyond yeah. text and image could ever do. Yeah, and I so. think you know there's still a sense of it's hard and it's slow yeah. and it's expensive and there's new ways to do it and it just has to be jumping in you know to, to do that and you know I, i'll echo what he said as well it's just the idea of audiences are getting younger and if younger audiences are used to video right now they're going to want that going forward so it's yeah. just a matter of you have to be there you have to find that way to communicate and to do that because it's going to be the way that people want to consume information Terrific. Joel, yeah. thank you yeah um and thank all of you for being here tonight as well and so now we're going to take some questions. Um, so if you have questions for me or Joel or Kiki or David, um, we'd love to continue the discussion. So my question is, how can these things be speeded up other than moving the cursor along? Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think it's, you know, what are we using video for? And, you know, in what ways? So. Um, you know, I still get a lot of emails. I'm on a lot of email lists. I get a lot of emails uh, with big blocks of text, and I'm just not reading it because right. I'm not sure what's in it, and I don't have the time to do it. Yeah, the video, the video that would just give the highlights, so not try to replace all of the text, mm -hmm. but just get me interested enough in the topic to then want to dive deeper. I think thinking about video not as a replacement for everything that we write, but really about the fact that people are not engaging, they're just deleting, they're not, they're, they're not engaging. And we just see from, from the, the actual uh, stats and 
and evidence that people will open those emails if they think there's a video there mm. two to three times more than that. So Or extra time on site. But it, I think to the point of, I don't know that anybody's saying right now, abolish a text and image and only have video, but it's about being able to have video comp content to complement that. And I'm curious to what Keith you Yeah. Think, I, so I, I, I'm, yeah, 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 I'm antsy because I want to talk about this so much. Um, so he's absolutely right. And one thing that's happening in communication right now is we know that, you know, smart speakers, everyone's talking about their Google Home, their Lexi device. I'm not going to turn her on right now, but she's listening. Um, but, you know, it's like, what about creating your flash briefings? What about creating this different type of content? And so one thing that I've done is that, yeah, I mean, he's absolutely right. It is not one size fits all for communication. But, but what if you take those highlights and you, you can um, just grab like uh, the best parts of what somebody's sharing on your, on your podcast, on your show, on whatever, and you turn that into, say, your flash briefing, create a little audiogram around it that has the captions right there for that part, and then share that across your social media. And that's what I've started doing with association chat, which is awesome because it's capturing people who might not have the time or interest to listen to the entire program, but they're still, they're still getting a highlight they're still getting awareness that that exists there. They're still finding out there's a flash briefing. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can take a piece of video and then you can turn it into your audio. You can turn it into your, you can transcribe it and turn it into articles. I mean, there's so much you can right. do. So I like to start from capturing the whole thing, ideally like, like on video and audio and then making things out of that. Yeah, that's really good. David, talk yeah. about a little bit about how video, how it's, it, it works with the deeper and, and written content that I'm sure you have at your association. Yeah, I just wanna you know, echo what Kiki said again. I mean, for us, it's really about engagement. And so is it the fastest way of getting information? Not necessarily, but like we have, um, you know, you mentioned we launched our talk show. And so the idea is that that gives, talking about access, We've had the former governor on, we've had the secretary of health talk about vaping. So we're bringing state level experts and practicing pr practitioners together. We're gonna start doing a, you know, a live stream so people can actually ask questions on the fly. And so that's something that you can't do via text. And, and we've, um, like Kiki mentioned actually, we started taking like highlights and snippets um, of our talk show, like a, just one question, one quick answer and posting those to Twitter. So we're talking about less than 90 seconds. And so people can get a really quick piece of information about, um, like for the vaping example, you know, it, the question was, what does a principal say when a kid says, oh, it's just flavored vape, there's nothing bad in there. And then so you got the Secretary of Health giving a 60 second answer, you know, watch the whole video. You could also mm -hmm. say, check out our website with all the resources, the text, the PDFs, the white papers but it really does drive engagement. And then like Kiki said, you can repurpose that. So not just smaller snippets, but if we have a talk show, well, we have a podcast also. Just pull out the audio and then people don't have time to sit in front of their computer. They can listen on their way home. They can do it on the treadmill. Um, it's really versatile. Yeah. Excellent. Can I, there's a really great tool, you guys. Um, I love these little, I, I'm going to just uh, throw this sure. out there because, you know, if you want to DIY it, like say you get your video, you have this beautiful video and you want to take a snippet from it. Um, there's a tool called sonics.ai and it's S-O-N-I-X.ai. And guys, I have no horse in this race. Like, I mean, I don't get, <laughs> there's like no um, affiliate or anything, but um but what's really cool is you can upload the video. You not only can get the transcript off of that, but you can actually select the piece of conversation that you find from say an hour long conversation, hour long interview, and download just that audio for your purposes. And so, um, and, and that's uploading the video right there. You can scroll through it really quickly and it doesn't take as much time. So there are ways to fast track um, and sort of give yourself some shortcuts to, to creating other types of content out of a, a yeah, good piece of video. That's excellent. Thank you. 
Um, terrific. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah. More questions. There's one back here. Hi, I have a question just regarding monetizing videos. How do we get a time and effort and turn it into actual membership, um, actual revenue? Right. Um, well, I'll just start with that, which is, you know, really understanding who your target audience is and making sure that your content is in the right place for that audience. So one way to have cash flow is more membership. So if you're recruiting, then who are we recruiting from? Where are we going to put this video so that it's likely to be seen by those people? That may not be on YouTube, right? Understanding um, those communities. And then there's other ways that organizations are monetizing content through um, sponsorship and other things, again, depending on the size of your audience and, and, and stuff. But, you know, Kiki, mm -hmm. you're, you're um, sort of building, uh, you know, a community around association chat, and you have to have a way to make that sustainable. So that's, oh, yeah. you know, something that you're thinking about as well. Yeah, I started offering sponsorships. And I mean, guys, I knew nothing about sponsorships. When I worked for associations back in the day, I did marketing and chapter relationships, and it was focused on really figuring out how to build communities. I moved into doing digital strategy work, and I never learned how to do selling and sponsorships. <laughs> and what I ended up having to do um, is figuring out how to maintain this thing and grow it because as association chat grew so did everything that went into it i had to pay for this and that and what i discovered is that you know when you have a really great uh, focused audience and most associations do there's a lot of value to the people who want to reach those people and if they know that your people are watching something at a certain time um, it's very powerful, you know, it, it's for, for them to see one influencer in their space who is being interviewed on your show or featured on your website and then to have their, their information close by or mentioned, it's really powerful. Yeah. And so for me, sponsorships, um, I, I really had dismissed it for a while, and now, like, that's the primary revenue generator for association chat. Absolutely. That's great. David, I think yeah. that there's another piece here, which is sponsorship sort of direct revenue from, from content, but I think there's another piece, which is just about engagement. You know, I hear a lot from associations where the, you know, the question all the time from the membership is, like, what have you done for me lately? Why am I paying my dues? Am I finding value in this community? So that's another piece to the economic picture, right? It's not just about direct revenue. It's really about people feeling like it's worth paying for. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're very fortunate in our state that most districts pay dues. So membership, we have the luxury of not worrying about that as much. I think 98% of the principals are our members which is unique and changes how we do things a little bit as an association. But you talk about sponsorships and you know, we've got a lot of big business in Washington. So we're talking about, can we have it, uh, the Alaska Airlines studio or, you know, the Microsoft, mm -hmm. you know, newscast or whatever and and work with some of these partners, um, you know, like that. And I think there's really an indirect audience too. like our actually most successful video. And this is, uh, I think of a bit of an example of how busy our members are. Um, we did a video on a Lopez Island School District, beautiful, beautiful island set in the San Juans. They grow 60% of the food they serve in their cafeteria. We went up there, did a little eight-minute mini documentary. Um, the Washington State Department of Agriculture shared it. It's been viewed over 15,000 times on their Facebook page. On our audience on YouTube, where the, most of our members watch our stuff, it's like 90 views, right? But our audience is not just our members, it's legislature, policymakers, parents, trying to tell um, the story of what it's like to be a principal these days. So to, like, that's really hard to, mon like, to monetize or get an ROI on, um, on creating a, a better, I guess, you know, all that storytelling and telling your members' experience and why people should care about whoever your members are. So um, yeah, when it comes to monetization, we don't have to, think about that very much. We're very fortunate. But I do know that there's a lot of stuff that you can accomplish on a video that you can't put a price on. Yeah. 
And Joel, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that Gather Voices makes easy is to put branding in individual videos, right? Yeah, absolutely. So within the video itself, it can be easy to have uh, an actual logo embossed in the video or to have an open card or an end card associated with that. Um, and that's a great way to bring in sponsors or to highlight that to bring back some revenue as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and even just to have people being able to easily make a video thanking sponsors that yeah. that were part of or supported the community. Yeah, and thinking beyond just the organization interacting with that one point of contact to the sponsor right. and being able to thank them, but think about digging deeper and reaching the people in the field or your people that are benefiting from this, being able to participate in that thank you or to showcase how that support is actually truly helping them back to the sponsor is really, really engaging. Yeah. And we've seen that work for a couple of our clients actually. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for yeah. the question. All right. Well, thank you all again. Um, everybody, uh, thank uh, Kiki and yes. and and, you, and David for joining us. And we're sorry you can't be in person in person <laughs> to uh, have a drink and 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 mingle. Um, uh, but uh, again, thank you both for for joining us tonight. Thank you. And David and I didn't even plan matching. Like we totally tie into the set. I don't know how that worked, but it's great. We we yeah. look figured everything out over here. So. <laughs> and I just want to say like thanks to Zakudo for having me. This was a really cool opportunity um, to you know meet both of Michael and Kiki and and the set looks amazing. It's something that yeah. being able to bring people in, it's really really cool and it's something that I wish when we got started we had that kind of access to. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. All right. Have a good night. Um, thank you all.